hello there. Uh, my name is John Coleman. I'm the Professor of Phonetics here in the University of Oxford. And we're here today in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford to look at a number of documents and texts from the ancient past. In my day job, actually, I teach on phonetics, that's the science of speech and spoken language. And normally I'm looking at recordings and people speaking modern languages, uh, contemporary living languages. But I also have a, a sort of semi-professional interest in writing and particularly writing from documents in the past. And today on this tour we're going to look at a small selection of things that uh, I've done some research on and, ha and would like to tell you about. Uh, documents in different languages, some rather obscure, some now lost, uh, that reveal interesting things about life in the past and also language in the past. And people sometimes ask me, how do we know what languages were like in the past? And the answer is, well, we have a rich documentation of languages from the past. Uh, and that's, that's one of, some of the things I want to share with you. Uh, so the first object I'd like to introduce to you is this document. It's a four-sided tablet uh, with a lot of writing on it that's written in the cuneiform script. And the language that is written here is ancient Sumerian. The cuneiform script was written by making impressions, sort of triangular impressions, on the surface of the clay using a stylus, which is a wooden tool, a bit like a chopstick, that was used to press triangular shapes into the clay. Uh, but a number of different languages were recorded using cuneiform writing, and the first one that we're going to be looking at is Sumerian. That's the oldest written language in the world. Um, this, this document is a historical document. It records the chronology of the kings of Sumer. Um, it was written in about 1800 BC, so it's already a pretty old document, but it records the succession of kings in Sumer back to about 3200 BC. In fact, so far back in history that really it becomes Sumerian, it descends into Sumerian mythology. They're recording the, uh, the mythical ancestors of their civilization and the first, the first kings. Um, but these are people, for instance, who had an extraordinarily long lives. They can't possibly have been real human beings. The language in which it was written was ancient Sumerian, but that was already pretty much a dying language by 1800, or at least it wasn't the language, wasn't the native language of the people living in this area at the time. At that time, uh, they were speaking Akkadian and Babylonian. These are two, two Semitic dialects related to modern Semitic languages like Hebrew and Arabic. But uh, the scribe, and the scribe who wrote this document would have been a native speaker of Akkadian. And uh, so, but he'd learned Sumerian as the learned scholarly language that was the important language of his society. So just as in more recent times in Europe, for instance, in the medieval time, and even through to, well, even, even to the mid 20th century, uh, it was thought very important to have documents in Latin in our, in our society. So uh, yeah, so the Bible would be written in Latin. Um, people would write academic books and so on in, in Latin. And a lot of uh, parliamentary records and legal, legal documents would be written in Latin in our society. It was like the, the important fi official sort of language uh, for, for certain kinds of activities, even though it wasn't anyone's first language. Similarly, Sumerian had the same kind of status in, in Babylonian and Akkadian society. It was the language that the that young scribes and students had to learn uh, in school. Sumerians are unrelated to Akkadian. It's a rather complex language. Um, it has uh, very large paradigms of verbs and nouns, which would have been a real test of memory for the uh, for the scribes to learn. But and but we've been able to having decoded, having deciphered cuneiform. Uh, we've learnt a lot about the Sumerian language thanks to the fact that they wrote textbooks, that is grammars of Sumerian and also uh, dictionaries, lexicons of Sumerian and their translations in Akkadian and in, as we'll see shortly in other languages too. So that's a very useful resource that opens a window onto this, onto this ancient language. So in the cabinet here on my left uh, there are a number of other cuneiform tablets that are written in the cuneiform script in a number of different languages, in fact. Uh, and some of them are older than the Sumerian king list that we were just looking at. In fact, the first few at this end of the top shelf uh, represent uh, very early stages of cuneiform at a point where what we see really are just little pictures, uh, or what appear to be little pictures, 
together with some numbers, and the numbers are shown by dots and half moons in the surface of the clay. Uh, and many of these are accountancy tablets. A lot of writing systems begin not with people writing messages to one another or writing down important texts, but simply recording financial transactions, uh, taking inventories, receipts, records of debts, that kind of thing. And that's how the earliest writing systems, including the cuneiform system, begins. Later on, it develops into a more elaborate writing system of the kind that we'd, we'd now rec recognise. The Sumerian king list I mentioned was uh, written by an Akkadian-speaking scribe, even though it's written in Sumerian. And so it was quite normal for those scribes to use documents that were written in two languages. They had Sumerian, Akkadian, bilingual texts. And uh, the unnumbered document uh, in this cabinet here, a uh, rather plain-looking, brown, broken cuneiform text, was found in uh, Egypt in the Tel El Amarna excavations, where a large deposit of cuneiform inscriptions was found. Because, of, because it's written in cuneiform, it's believed to have been written by a scribe from Mesopotamia. It's in two columns, which normally indicates uh, a bilingual text. In fact, it is bilingual. On the right-hand column uh, are, is a list of words for parts of pieces of furniture in a house, and they're written in Akkadian, the language of the scribe. But on the left, what we see is the transcription of those words as they were pronounced, or as the scribe thought they were pronounced, in ancient Egyptian. So we see what we have here is a private vocab book in which a, you know, an, a literate, educated person living in a foreign country, that is in ancient Egypt, is writing down, trying to write down the sounds of the language around him, that is ancient Egyptian. We're used to seeing ancient Egyptian being written down in Egyptian hieroglyphics, of course, and working out how they were pronounced is a little bit challenging. But here's, a kind of, here's one of the kinds of documents that helps us to understand because a scribe has tried to write down how this foreign language, Egyptian, was pronounced. We can get some idea about how it sounded to, to him. And that's a very valuable piece of information. So in amongst all of these uh, old tablets of one kind or another, most of them are written in cuneiform, there is uh, one which is particularly interesting to me, number 36 here, which is a letter, a private letter, that's written in Aramaic. This is not as old as the others. This is from about 475 BC, so about nearly 500 BC. And it's written in Aramaic. Uh, Aramaic and it's written in pen, pen and ink, on the surface of an old piece of pot. Now, Aramaic is a language that is closely related to modern Hebrew. Uh, and in fact, this letter was written, this is from uh, a community of uh, Jewish people who were living on Elephantine Island in the Nile in, in Egypt. Um, but as I say, it's written in, in Aramaic and it's written in an alphabet. So the speakers of Semitic languages such as Aramaic, Canaanite, uh, Phoenician, these are all dialects of Semitic languages closely related to Biblical Hebrew, um, and it's, as I say, it's a letter from one uh, person to another. So it's written on a piece of pottery, broken pottery. Why pottery? Well, pottery was the packaging of the day in the ancient world. Museums are full of old pots. They're used for uh, storing, all, well, all food and drink of every sort is stored in a pot, cooked in a pot, used in a pot. Pottery was, uh, was what you had around. But pots get broken. When pots get broken, what do you do? You throw it away. Nowadays, we live in a very throwaway society, but in the ancient world, people used the resources they had, and this is one of the things they used broken pots for, was writing on. It's just like if you have a builder around or a tradesman and they want to write a, mes a memo to themselves, you know, a list of things they've got to get, or perhaps a bit of costing, what might they do? Get a cardboard box, tear off the, the edge of the cardboard box and, and write a few words on it. Well, that's what's going on here. Most of the people at this time in this society were not literate, but a number of people were educated and they could get a job as a scribe and serve as someone who would write a letter to you. Community uh, where this was found was on, say, on Elephantine Island in Egypt, an island in the Nile, and there was a ferry connecting the, connecting the island to the other bank. And in order to uh, send messages across to the island, there was a scribe who set up his stall, as it were, 
at the quayside where the ferry was. So in order to send a message to a relative or a friend on the island, you would go down to the quayside, find the scribe and say, send a message to so-and-so, Uncle Jeremy or whoever it may be, Grandma, uh, and tell her this. And then the scribe would write down what it says, We'd give, the, give the message to someone who was going on a journey across the ferry who would then take it to the family or perhaps get uh, someone who was literate on the other side to tell them what it says. So this is a family letter from, from one person to another, extremely fascinating. When we see it here in the, in the dry, dusty cabinet, it, it doesn't, you know, it's just an old, an old script like, like any other. But when we can read it, it really opens up life uh, in ancient times. And I'll tell you what it says. So it's a message to someone called Hoshaya. Uh, and that's written on the, the top line. It says, to Hoshaya. In this script, uh, only the consonants are written. In, in, in the first alphabets, uh, they only wrote the consonants. Um, and so the name Hoshaya is spelled H, Sh, uh, sorry, H, W, Sh, A, uh, Y, H. And that's the same name as the biblical name of the prophet uh, Hosea. It's in the, in the Old Testament. But that was a common, um, a common name uh, amongst Jewish people uh, at that time. And it says, to Hoshaya, the second line says, Shalom. Still a word we recognize um, from, uh, from Hebrew, the Hebrew greeting, peace, you know, greetings. Uh, so it says, Shalom, the first few letters. So even at this, even at two and a half thousand years old, we can see this. To Hoshaya, greetings. Take care of the children until Ahutab gets there. Don't trust anyone else with them. And then on the other side of the, the ostracon, the, remain, the letter goes on. If the flour for your bread has been ground, make up a small portion of dough to last until their mother gets there. So he's explaining to them how to feed the children. And then he concludes by saying, let me know when you'll be cele celebrating Passover. And the word that they use for Passover is Pesach, which I first came across that word in my diary. So even in, you know, in everyone's diaries, those days when they have the page at the front with the different uh, dates and festivals of, of different cultural cultures, um, in, the, in the section on, I think it was April this year, uh, it says the, the first day of Passover is Pesach, and that's the word that's used even in, in the modern Hebrew language, and it appears even in English diaries. But there it is. Let me know when you'll be celebrating Passover. And then it concludes, tell me how the baby is doing. So it's a beautiful little glimpse of family life in ancient times. So this uh, hieroglyphic inscription is written not in Egyptian hieroglyphs, but Luwian hieroglyphs. And the Luwians were people who lived in uh, ancient Anatolia, modern-day Turkey, and also northern Syria, northern Syria. It's one of a number of people who lived in that area at that time. Uh, the best are known of whom are actually people who we now call the Hittites. And the Hittites weren't known to ancient civilization other than through the Bible. So it was a bit of a surprise when Hittite civilization, or the documents and letters of Hittite civilization, were eventually discovered and the Hittite language was deciphered. Uh, these group people, the, the Luwians, spoke what you might call a dialect of Hittite, um, but they had their, their own hieroglyphic script. Uh, as you can see, it's quite pictorial. And what we've got here is, this would have been a big monumental um, inscription celebrating a particular king. We know it's King Kamanis. And, um, and it, perhaps it would have celebrated his great military victories or his important status as a king. Uh, but all we have left here is the bottom end of the inscription, and it ends in a warning or even a, a sort of curse in a way, uh, invoking people not to deface or defile the document. It was actually not uncommon in the ancient world when one uh, king conquered another's territory, uh, they might well chip his name out of the inscriptions to sort of obliterate his name, the, the, the loser's name from history. Uh, and so what it says, what the part we've got left says exactly is uh, this, I'll translate. It says, uh, what we've got here says, whoever hammers away these words, against him may the thunder god, the god Kahuhus, and the god Kubaba, by prosecution, do something or other. I just want to look at a few of the words and names. So you can see this symbol here, which looks a bit like a guitar, is in fact the symbol for a hammer, 
and that's used there for the verb to, to chip away, because of course inscriptions like this are made literally by chipping away at the, um, the stone with a hammer. There are three names of gods, and the symbol for a god is this symbol here, here, and here. Uh, the first god who's mentioned uh, is called Tahunzus in, in Luwian, um, and Tahunt in, in Hittite. And that may seem, that may be a god's name you're not familiar with, but it's actually more familiar than you may think. Because Luwian, unlike some of the other languages we look at, is actually an Indo European language that's related to modern European uh, languages. Uh, and so the name of the thunder god, uh, Tarhunzas, or Tarhund, is actually related to the name of the Norse god, Thor, for instance, the thunder god. But the name uh, Tarhunzas or Tarhunt is also thought by many philologists and uh, linguists to have survived to the modern day as the name Tarquin. So the, uh, the, it's thought that the Etruscan civilization uh, borrowed the name of the god Tarhunt. Uh, and the Romans borrowed the name from them as Tarquin, the legendary first kings of, of Rome, and now we have Tarquin as a, a modern male personal name that we've uh, got from uh, Roman times. So the second god mentioned here is Karhuhas, uh, and then the third god is Kubaba, and that god or goddess also has a, um, a bird as, as their symbol. Uh, and this is, a, in fact, a goddess, Kubaba. That's a name that was borrowed by other people in Anatolia. For instance, the Phrygians also worshipped Kubaba. Uh, and the Greeks borrowed a version of that name as Kibele, the, um, the, go the goddess Kibele. So that comes from the Anatolian civilizations. So, and, and what will happen to the person who defiles this object? Well, the gods will do something uh, terrible to them. What is it exactly? Well, this, that's denoted by this symbol in which we see two faces in profile looking at one another. That's a, a symbol that's sometimes used to mean to argue with one another, two, two, two heads looking at one another. And there's an object in between them which symbolises something. I'm not sure what. Um, but uh, this hieroglyph, as it were, this symbol by its, uh, in this form is taken to mean something like to dispute or to litigate with one another in law or to one person to prosecute another. That's the symbol that's used for that meaning. So when we visit a museum like this, we see all these interesting historical artefacts and they're very important objects from their time. But very often they have some kind of text, some script, some language. Um, they bear some text or some script or some language. So keep a look at, out for that kind of thing when you're going around the museum. And remember that these were written by real people who were living in a particular world, um, praising their kings, warning their enemies, and also writing personal family letters from one another, recording their history. These scripts have in many cases, or sometimes of history, been lost to us and we didn't know what they meant for a time. But by in those cases where we can work out what they, what they once said, then we can recover a very detailed glimpse into what would otherwise be a lost world.